Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. <laughs> We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, go boom. God damn, uh, I guess we're getting, this is a podcast, we can get computery. Yeah. I am Michael, I'm joined by my friend and co-host, Eric. Yeah, that's me. And, uh, today on Double Feature, we're gonna get, we're gonna get, uh, we're gonna get nerdy. We're gonna do, uh, two films, one with a director we've seen before and one with a cast everyone's seen before. What are we calling them? Yeah, how could you say nerdy? This is deadly hardware and software. Deadly. <laughs> Lives are at stake. Uh, we're doing sneakers and existence. Which thankfully I know is pronounced existence. And I we'll get to talk all about that. Yeah. But this is at the listener request of one Greg Winter who helped fund our Kickstarter. So a huge thanks to Greg. This is your, uh, your moment in the spotlight where we are doing uh, your film Sneakers and we're going to do it first. Actually, I don't think it's Greg Winter's film Sneakers. I don't think he had anything to do with making I Sneakers. I have no information on Greg Winter's involvement. He did at some point uh, see the film Sneakers and decide we should talk about it. Or maybe he didn't see the film Sneakers and decided uh, we should talk about it. I think we've covered all our bases. Sounds like you could start a podcast. <laughs> right. You see a film or don't see it, and then you talk about it and take all the credit so for having made it. We're going to have one of those um, those conversations that normal people would consider spoilers, I think. Uh -huh. Use the fucking chapters in the show and just skip over. If you don't know how to use the chapters, just stop uh, listening right now and uh, kill yourself. So Sneakers came out in 1992. That's the important date to remember here. Uh -huh. When you're watching Sneakers and asking the question of, sure, I've seen Sneakers, why is that important in the entire history yeah. of films? And I think the cover uh, tries to tell you why it thinks it's notable, you know, by listing off the cast. And of course, we'll get to the gigantic uh, mammoth names that are in Sneakers. But 1992 was a really interesting time for this subgenre of science fiction or drama. The fact you don't really know if it's sci-fi or drama is one of the interesting things about it. Mm -hmm. It's really a pretty, especially looking at it now, it is a way real world drama oh yeah it's just drama but at the time it came out it was you know it's not future or hypothetical technology so it's only on the edge of sci-fi right so let's look at the movies that came before it in this kind of genre we had uh let's call it the hacker genre uh -huh. because we also have stuff like the conversation or things that were a little bit more about wiretapping sure this started back with, I would say, Tron, which we did on the show. Yep. Or maybe even War Games. Yeah. And then there was a gap before anybody really tackled the subject matter, brought it out of the 80s arcade, and tried to bring it in a, you know, in a modern contemporary setting with adults. Well, and it's, it's pretty much in line with when video games went from arcades to home consoles and computers finally got small enough to be in a room sure. with a person. That's another funny thing too, right? Is once the arcade goes away, these Tron movies, they just stopped being made because yeah. where would they take place? Right. You know, the part of the imagination that the 80s arcade uh, lived in hadn't died out, but the physical 80s arcade had. Sure. So it wasn't until after Sneakers, and therefore these films owe some kind of debt to Sneakers, if for no other reason than the popularization of the genre, that you started seeing things like, you know, we've joked many a time about The Net, mm -hmm. a movie with which just barely uh, almost got double featured with yeah. sneakers before you made the wiser decision <laughs> to strike that down. But also Hackers came out that same, sure. you know, that was 95. That was about halfway through right. the, yeah, that's five years, 95, halfway through the 90s. Mm -hmm. But you also had Enemy of the State coming out. Sure. You had uh, The Matrix was late 90s. Right. Uh, even Office Space had a very heavy computer. You know, that was the throwaway B story from Office Space was, oh, we'll, right. we'll uh, hack the computers. The other thing that Sneakers kind of modernized and not nearly as definitively as the hacking genre, but... If you look at sneakers, you look at the kind of um, 
the the tribulations of infiltration mm -hmm. with these high tech and I'm not talking about just the computer software. I'm talking specifically about having to walk slowly through a room that is exactly your body temperature so as sure, not to trip. Sure. I mean, that's just Mission Impossible. Yeah, right. It's got this really real world bent on the uh, James Bond Mission Impossible spy kind of infiltration. But it, it shows something like that without having, or at least seemingly, without having a maniacal evil villain that's bent on world domination sure until we get that or what was that movie uh entrapment i think was yeah. another one of those with the all the laser rigs and you know the mission impossible uh film series didn't really come back until 96 right when the tom cruise again uh years after sneakers sure once again held the public fascination with you know high-tech computer rooms and sealed off and body temperature and it's doing a lot of that Mission Impossible stuff, but you might uh, speculate that the Mission Impossible film would never have seen an audience if, uh, if sneakers hadn't existed. And I think you see that stuff even after, you know, 2000 at Takedown and Swordfish and Antitrust and all of these other really computer-focused hacker movies uh, tried to keep it real world. But The Matrix was the point where that spun off in another direction mm -hmm. you know it went okay we have people at computers doing the hacking what if that meant they could enter another world and get superpowers right you know that's an incredibly oversimplified dumbed down version of the matrix i mean i remember when we talked about you know that on our show we we spoke very little of any of those elements but that's what the public picked up from the matrix mm -hmm. and why i think there were two sequels when you look at the sequels, they focus heavily on the we can change anything, we have superpowers kind of element. Right. And so, you know, no one has to make the case that The Matrix influenced the rest of sci-fi for decades. Right. But you look back on something like Sneakers now and you go, well, I don't understand. You know, early 90s, no big to do about it drama piece. But these weren't really happening again in the 90s until this movie, you know really found its place mm -hmm. it's trying to speak close to my heart too and going well we're going to talk about technology and we're going to do it uh in a way that's not really talking down to people right you know they make it as literally as accessible as they can while speaking about real world technology sure they have the whole thing is shot maybe a fucking hour from here some of the scenes are even closer from where i'm at now News to double feature people who haven't listened in a fucking year is I don't live in Chicago anymore. <laughs> but it, a lot of it's out here in the valley. And the stuff that isn't is, you know, in San Francisco. When they, uh, they dump him out of the car or whatever, uh, he comes back and there's Alcatraz, you know, in the background. Sure. Past the, uh, the poor infrastructure, San Francisco up and down roads. Mm -hmm. uh, they find the guy who was shot in the limo in Palo Alto, which is right over here. It's the fancy people part of Silicon right. Valley. When your startup makes it big or you become an executive in a huge company, you go live in Palo Alto. I mean, so imagine this from the perspective of pretend you live in a cool city, mm -hmm. like not in the Valley, but in say Chicago, right? Mm -hmm. So imagine if, if you can for a moment, Michael, you live in Chicago. All right. There's a scene where they're trying to locate these different areas based on sound that's really fucking cool yeah you know forget how unreasonable a premise it is for a moment but going okay you live in this area there are four bridges that surround it they all sound different let's use clues about you know about the area sure it's man you really hit that hey that's my town you know spot yeah. to go let's talk about the sound the fucking bridges uh, right. make to these different areas also funny to look at this today and think about, you know, this big role the NSA plays, uh, who isn't chartered for civilian surveillance or yeah. whatever they say in the movie. Definitely not involved in spying on the public at large. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whoops. I think it's so funny to watch a lot of these movies before. I mean, that's a very recent incident, the NSA stuff. Mm -hmm. But they also joke a little bit about flying, you know, crashing planes or whatever. Right. A joke that would never make it in a movie that is as safe as sneakers. Right. Uh, even, you know, 10, 13 years after uh, 9-11. 
So let's get to this cast. Yeah. Right? Because that's what the movie is known for. Sure. It's boasting this huge cast. It's what the movie thinks is important. And you and I on Double Feature, and this is no secret, we just did, okay, perfect example. We just did two films last week where I don't, I think I could maybe name two actors. And they're both Rucker Hauer. In the entirety of both films. There's a big thing in Hollywood, and and I don't necessarily subscribe to it. I don't know who does. Uh, if you do, shoot us an email. Let me know why this matters to you. Doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. Why does it matter that a film has a massive cast of people you're familiar with? Ensemble cast. Yeah. I mean, why why is that going to change the makeup of a film? I get that their delivery is good and that maybe, I don't know, you and I like to watch Jason kill people ten times in a row. Sure. So sure. maybe maybe Robert Redford is someone's Jason. <laughs> I don't I don't think it's quite like that. It might be a little bit like that. Robert Redford leading the pack of the the ragtag team of hackers. Uh-huh. Which man talk about influence that also became think about fucking swordfish and sure. movie hackers and oceans 11 <laughs> well and definitely the spy genre stuff you know we didn't talk a lot about bond but also you saw in the last 10 or 20 years how much more hacker oriented the bond films sure have become. mission impossible as well even the fucking fourth die hard was about computer oh, hacking I, justin long hacks into your traffic system kevin smith hacks into everything the Italian job being another one. Right. Even the fucking spy movies are, well, we got to get Seth Green to hack the computers. That's going to be an important part. He's the Napster. Oh, my God. All right. Sorry. <laughs> Seth Green is not in this movie. Uh, Robert Redford is. And I think people, they see, you know, Sneakers doesn't know that it's going to hit this, this key point at this key moment in the history of a genre. They're not aware of that. That's just the premise for their movie. They thought it'd be fun. They go into it and they're like, we're going to put our money on the cast. And they didn't know that 10 years later, this cast would be kind of, eh, yeah. I kind of know some of those people. You know, not a lot of the cast would still be around, but man, would the influence they had on the genre still, still stick here. Which is funny, but I mean, you know, uh, Sidney Poitier, who is probably best known for Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Mm-hmm. But that's what, in the 60s? He's just a huge pillar in Hollywood. I mean, talk about, I mean, those two guys, Robert Redford, now responsible for Sundance everything. <laughs> right. And Sidney Poitier, who, I mean, just a groundbreaking actor. Right. I mean, these two guys, shoulder to shoulder, that's no laughing matter even in 1992. Yeah. Robert Redford and Sidney Poitier may have done their most memorable roles back in the 60s and 70s. I mean, Perfect example, Robert Redford is the Sundance kid and went on to name his career <laughs> sure. afterward in the film festival of independent film today, Sundance. Yeah. But that doesn't stop them from showing up in 1992 and everybody who grew up with them and everybody recognizes them. These guys can show up in a film about computers and nobody goes, you're too old for computers. <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure. They're the guys who would have played the, you know, the out of touch parental figures in right. a movie like Tron. Right. They're now the the very guys who enable Jeff Bridges to come back as an old man in the Tron sequel. Right. But I do think everybody in the movie was of some note, if not just at the time, even now. David Stradiron, we've seen so many times on the show. He was in Cold Souls. He was in LA Confidential. Sure. Good night and good luck. Yeah, well, he was Edward R. Murrow. And yeah, you know, right. I mean, David Stratton. What bigger place could you have? He on hit. The show? He hit a really fascinating stride in the late '90s and early 2000s, where he was a character actor in films like Sneakers for years, mm -hmm. and suddenly, for some reason, he just started becoming a leading man and just an actor people love to watch. Sure. And he nails it every time. Sure. So, so far we've got three actors that at least I'm familiar with as great actors. Not that I understand why that matters. <laughs> people like seeing their friends, man. They like going to the movies and going, I know that guy. He's good in movies. I'll, I'll hang out with him for an hour. Um, Mary McDonald had an interesting career too. You know, big Battlestar Galactica stuff, but... Also, uh, pretty sure she was Donnie Darko's mom. Donnie Darko's mom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we talk about Donnie Darko because the behind the mask she was in is the behind the mask we don't talk about on the show. Right. Matthew Fox was uh, uh -huh. was in that one. 
Right. Ben Kingsley, especially lately, seems to be showing up all over the fucking place. Yeah. But we saw him on the show in Schindler's List. And he's a powerhouse as well. He's the David Stratton of the 90s. Well, and he had that big fucking thing as Gandhi in the 80s. Sure. He's the kind of the the frenemy, is what sure. Joss Whedon would probably call this role sure. uh, in the movie. You know, the guy who sits on the morally ambiguous line, you're not really sure where his allegiance lies. You know you can't <laughs> trust him, but... Robert Redford seems to trust him for some stupid reason, so you're just going to go with it. Right. And then I guess, of course, we have to say, you know, for our our modern sensibilities, that he was also uh, one of the most amazing parts of the third Iron Man movie. Sure. One of the most unexpected parts of the- Wonderfully good. Who would have had any idea? Yeah. He's the guy in this movie who knows a computer would never match Mary McDonnell with Stephen uh, Tobolowski. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. <laughs> uh, yeah, and there's there's also a smaller character who I was so sad to see go so early, but Danal Logue plays the uh, the character that gets murdered. He's the reason that the story ever unfolds. Sure. Well, he is to you what Clea Duvall is to me. Right. I think that's yeah, and and he gets he gets. Bumped off really early. Now, this is Danal Logue. I don't know if I've ever gone on uh, and on and on and on on Double Feature about how much I loved the FX series Terriers. Mm -hmm. But he's the lead in Terriers. He's, I mean, he's a big TV actor. He's done films, but he, he, do you remember Grounded for Life? Yeah. He was the lead in Grounded for Life. Okay, sure. So again, I guess this is me just backpedaling but he's an actor that if i see him in a movie and i go hey i like this guy i'll stick around for what he's dead i'm leaving well and then you know steven i think it's tobolowski Mm -hmm. is i don't know how to pronounce his name we saw him in uh memento he was one of the voices in buried uh we didn't see him notably in adaptation because his part got cut after filming So I don't know if that's actually available anywhere or if you can find that. That's another good double feature show at gmail.com if uh, you know where we can see his part in adaptation. But he's got a little bit of a show-stealing role toward the end of the movie, too. Mm -hmm. He becomes, uh, you know, he gets probably more screen time than the villain uh, in the movie. And then Dan Aykroyd. Oh, Dan Aykroyd. So, I mean... You know, I'm going to be nice and not talk about conspiracy theories uh, too much <laughs> on our show because I feel like I'll get in a Dan Aykroyd rant. So let me, let me position this in a different way. I don't even want to say he's a conspiracy evangelist so much as a UFO evangelist. Uh-huh. The populist narrative-driven person in me wants to say Dan Aykroyd's just playing himself. That's what people say about movies, right? Mm-hmm. When they're reviewing movies. Sure. Dan Aykroyd, who plays himself in this film. Uh, he talks about how we didn't land on the moon. Uh, I mean, in a, in a movie that still relies on the polygraph, which is the low-budget polygraph they have in this movie is probably just as ineffective as an actual polygraph. Mm-hmm. There's some technological pseudoscience and some uh, straight-out misinformation regarding the conspiracies. But it's a fun, quirky, comedic part. It's not to, meant to be taken too seriously. Dan Aykroyd, though... The only thing I think I need to say is there's this video that exists, a documentary film, sort of, called Dan Aykroyd Unplugged on UFOs. Dan Aykroyd uh, has lobbied on Larry King and in other places for the U.S. to create laws that would uh, affect, you know, aliens unfairly coming to abduct citizens of the United States so that we could, you know, have fair trials and... Just a lot of really, really nutty stuff, which I I mention only because it's terribly interesting, and I think people should should go on a web search uh, adventure with that. Dan Aykroyd unplugged on UFOs. But there's a lot of that. There's anagrams, which I think are, you know, anagrams are just hilarious to me. Mm -hmm. Has anyone ever concealed any real piece of useful information in an anagram? I doubt it. When you talk about conspiracies with people, they like to blow your mind with anagrams and that's when you know you're talking to someone who probably has nothing of any substance to contribute sure well of course these people orchestrated this conspiracy can't you tell they hit it right in front of you it's like the illuminati they're right on the dollar bill why would they there's just these why would they do that it doesn't make any fucking sense but it seems like for every piece of misinformation or silly conspiracy that the movie you know brings out 
they have another interesting piece of technology, some mathematical theory they brush against. Uh, this movie is kind of infamous in another set of circles for having a YMP in the film, mm -hmm. which is that giant computer. You know, when they walk into, they're in Ben Kingsley's uh, character's kind of office, and he does that, shh, they're listening, and walks them over into the quiet glass room. Uh -huh. They go in there, and there's a giant computer behind them, and they sit on what looks like this bench. The bench is actually part of the computer. <laughs> it's a really iconic piece of the YMP design is that it was this supercomputer you bought for your business, but since it costs so much fucking money, I mean, I guess, I don't know why they did this. Maybe they need the bench to help cool it or something. But I would speculate that it costs so much goddamn money that you put it, you don't hide it away like a server in a closet like today. It doesn't live in its own building. You put it right in the middle of the fucking office and it's a, it's a set piece. Mm -hmm. People can go sit on it and, you know, you put it by the water cooler yeah. <laughs> essentially to go look at this powerful piece of computing technology we just bought for our company. And that was probably a big deal when people were first trying to sell computers to smaller businesses and offices. You want that thing to be in a spotlight so everyone can fucking see it. Right. And, you know, your, your piece of technology gets a little uh, advertisement. So a lot of stuff in sneakers, smaller, under-the-surface things that uh, you know, we can look back at 10 years later and point to as a really specific example of a, really a genre leader. So first thing I'll tell you immediately is you know from doing our slasher marathons on this show, uh, which the double feature audience uh -huh. likes to affectionately call Killapaloozas, that convention spelling and other title guidelines make me fucking crazy sure they just confuse me and upset me and i want everything to be in a neat package well and, and existens it bothered me for that reason until i saw it i remember it. that when we first started talking about doing existens you're like is that is that how it's pronounced and i was like i don't know <laughs> i'm sure they'll say it in the movie <laughs> uh this movie opens with a character writing existence on a blackboard <laughs> telling you how to spell it and how it's pronounced. And then giving you a description of what the, the thing is yeah. and why it's important in the movie. It's, it's perfect. It's seriously like getting a fucking briefing. It's so good. The movie's already won me over at that point. It just, it immediately, David Cronenberg goes, I named it this, shut up, it's called that, stop <laughs> whining, let's watch this movie. Well, and then goes on, to shame me for having not seen the movie for whatever reason. Right. So this is, uh, I want to let you know that watching this, or really at, at your, you know, I have a list of Cronenberg stuff we haven't seen I'd like to do at some point. Mm -hmm. And every time we write the schedule, I sort of just fling it at you and go, hey, let's do one of these. I don't know which one. Assuming that you've seen all the ones I haven't. Right. In reality, I think we probably haven't think seen. We're pretty even. David Cronenberg is one of my favorite filmmakers. So mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm just a complete fucking moron for not watching all his films. I don't know what's preventing me from doing that. Yeah. Knowing they'll come up on the show someday, I guess, is not wanting to double my efforts. But pairing this with sneakers at your recommendation over the net, <laughs> it really created one of the greatest nights of my life. Yeah. I didn't know that there was more classic prime cronenberg out there oh my god that we hadn't exhausted at all well we i mean we we both come at david cronenberg from two very different but incredibly similar places mm -hmm. i come at david cronenberg wanting every single david cronenberg movie to be naked lunch sure and i believe you come at david cronenberg hoping that you can see videodrome 2 somewhere in his <laughs> filmography sure and Although we should say that we both have a profound respect for the uh, the more modern ones, oh, yeah. especially the ones we covered on the show. Yeah, I mean, I I don't want to I don't want to come on and belittle the other David Cronenberg films, but we definitely have a, a place where we live. I live around Naked Lunch and The Fly. You live around Videodrome and The Fly, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. And so to see Existence and to be watching it and see a gun made of lizard bones. Oh god. And this this level of intrigue and 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 uh and spy kind of shit. <laughs> Suddenly I go, "Oh my god, Eric and I have both found the film we were missing." Yeah. This is my Naked Lunch 2 and this is Eric's Videodrome for people to see. 
<laughs> right? A video drone that people will actually watch with me. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe. I thought that existence would be. So, I mean, we don't need documentation of my misconceptions about this movie. Sure. Uh, Do you, anywhere, you thought it was about erectile enlargement? That no, makes sense. Something else. No, I mean, I thought this would be a movie that was kind of. David Cronenberg tried to do some weird digital stuff in the 90s. It's an experimental You thought it was going to be David Cronenberg's Lawnmower Man. I didn't know that this would be right in his fucking wheelhouse. Yeah, you know right? what I mean? <laughs> I didn't know that this would be... You know, you see David Cronenberg's game system, and fuck, man, I could have told know. you exactly what it would look like <laughs> before I saw it. That seems like a just an experimental game you play. Yep. Where you just go, what if David Cronenberg designed a blender? Yeah. <laughs> the Roomba by David Cronenberg. Sure. You know? Right. So you go, yeah, game systems, especially in the post-E3 climate. Everybody's talking about new, exciting game systems. What if David Cronenberg had a, a crowdfunded so good. game system that he was putting out? What would it look like? Well, it'd probably be a, a, I don't know, fleshy thing. It would have to be that. And it would pulsate, look a little bit like an organ, uh, maybe move between a, a crawl and a thrust. Mm -hmm. And uh, you you probably use it by touching it in some way vaguely sexual. That's, I don't know, maybe it goes in a port in your body. I mean, these are, it is so perfectly Cronenberg. And in this particular case, as much as I like seeing him do all these new different things, and that's exciting for me, to know that there was still one of the good old body horror things out there, I did not anticipate that. All the technology in the film, though. You know, the gun was a big one, but the oh, yeah. his cell phone in the beginning is sure. a little eel orb slimy thing. Sure. Rubbery. Ugh. Well, the gun fucking shoots teeth. I right? mean, all the technology feels like you don't really want to touch it. It's creepy. And what's, I mean, we talked about the cast with sneakers but to see jude law in, oh, yeah. in this place i mean oh this god is, i know this is on the heels of or maybe even right before gattaca this is sure jude law for a brief i guess it's not so brief because he was in ai too but jude law doing sci-fi mm -hmm. is just this wonderful thing because he carries this human gravity that when you throw him in an immersive video game yeah he both gets wantonly carried away and erratically terrified well that's the part where if we so let's say we started out watching existence and rather than you know letting this conversation be dominated by how floored i am that this is you know a great example of old stuff right let's pretend we knew it was the old stuff what's going to set this apart is that we do not have our prototypical naked lunch hero right we don't have our underground mind beaming you know sure there's still a resistance and a lot of that great yeah. stuff. A lot of those motifs we're returning to, but Jude Law is this young, sure, scared, innocent. It's one of the only times in Cronenberg film where the lead isn't okay. Let's go with that. Yeah, right. Uh, I mean, I know that. I know that that's a. It's a big thing in Naked Lunch, and it's definitely a big thing in Videodrome. The Fly, even. I put this VHS tape where. Sure. Even into uh, if you go into films like Eastern Promises. Naomi Watts' character isn't, she's not abhorrent to the storyline. She's comfortable being immersed in this mystery and in this, this whole thing that's going on. Yeah, you just go for it. Yeah, Existence is this film where the lead character goes, I don't want to do that. I don't even play video games. I prefer not to. And, uh, and you kind of get this air early on when everybody plugs in and goes, the game has begun. You sit there and go, well... Are we in the game now? <laughs> right. Are we still in the game? Even though they're out when of the game, the game are yeah. they still in the game? Yeah. Is gas in the game? Oh my God, gas. Okay, hold on. We'll get to the meta layers in a second. We've been talking about this for several minutes without mentioning Willem Dafoe in a Cronenberg movie. Is just, <laughs> you know, across from Jude Law, right? Right. All you needed to ever show me was either of them in a frame with directed by David Cronenberg sure. on the bottom. But to have them acting apart from each other, young, innocent, juvenile Jude Law, and, you know, old war horse Willem right? Dafoe, seasoned veteran <laughs> of the weird. I think, I think that there are these moments in um, films directed by these guys that we like. Uh, Rob Zombie, I think, did it with Bill Mosley in Devil's Rejects. Mm -hmm. I know Quentin Tarantino does it all the time. 
Robert Rodriguez definitely did it with El Rey in Planet Terror. Yeah. I think there are these moments where directors find actors that are just them, but more talented, and they stick them in a film and go basically be Rob Zombie for two hours, but be (laughs) it better than I could be on purpose. Sure. I feel like gas is one of just embodies the Cronenberg. It's just David Cronenberg going, (laughs) okay, Willem, I need you to be me, but less self-aware. Yeah. He takes every element of, I mean, gas seems like the kind of guy who's going to roll with. Sure. He's the normal, the normal protagonist. If uh, our female lead isn't exactly. Oh, and I love her too. I mean, I think she, you know, she allows Jude Law's character to be the damsel in distress. <laughs> She's supposedly the shy one when we get introduced to her, whatever fucking metal layer we're on at that point. <laughs> and, uh, or don't know we're on at that point, I guess. And then we see her really take his hand and say, come on, come on this adventure with me. This is how we're going to do it. And watching how that just becomes more and more, I don't know, seeing her in that last scene where she's won. Sure. I can't even use the term last scene. Right. Seeing her in the scene where she has quote unquote won the game versus when she's shy video game programmer introducing it Uh is a complete fucking 180. And I think that's a little true of Jude Law as well. So you have these two characters that are moving in parallel. They're both becoming, uh, one is clearly, you know, Jude Law is the damsel in distress, Mm -hmm. but they're both coming from a place where we're supposed to at least believe that they're shy and at the end they're supposed to become empowered so it's instead of the fast track route of david cronenberg movies where you know characters just have to jump in and get it or where their bodies fall apart i guess it's also (laughs) the opposite we see a lot is where they're empowered until all of their limbs slowly fall off their body and they're Mm -hmm. left as a a skeleton with hair Mm-hmm. Or maybe a skeleton covered in hair. Oh, David Cronenberg movies are so good. <laughs> There's these two characters. He goes, oh, I'm going to do this different thing with this story arc, and I'm going to do it with both characters. And at the end, you're not going to know if that means anything or not. Right. right? While he's at it, uh, poured in the spine, you know, he makes yeah. the penetration comparison for you. Sure. It's going... The stuff that I usually pretend is subtle, like when there's a hole in a character's body and you have to finger them uh, every couple scenes. Right. I'm just going to go... Oh, you know, I don't want to put this hole in my spine because it's like penetration, like sexual penetration, like you're going to lube me for sexual penetration. Right. Just go ahead and get that out of the way. Uh, but I also think, you know, talking about how their bioports are excited. Sure. You know, just Cronenberg using even just language in the film to talk about things in a way where they're a little grosser. Right. Uh, or evoking more imagery than maybe they actually are. It's helping that imagery become really overt. So much so that I think you might even read into it too much. You know, every time his character talks about being vulnerable, I just assume there's some weird sex thing going on, right. <laughs> even though even though there's really not a lot to indicate that. But I just know his bioport's going to get fingered and excited later. So, <laughs> uh, all right. So we have this game that people are moving into, uh-huh. which is also the point where existence is different than what I thought it might be in that we represent the game with the real world. Right. That leads us into a natural place where we can start using these worlds within worlds and not really know where we are because things look pretty realistic. Mm -hmm. And also it's a Cronenberg world. So, you know, the real world has weird stuff that goes on in it. You're just not really sure. A gun made out of fish parts. Yeah. You just go, well, yeah, that, that was real life because that's what guns look like in a David Cronenberg movie. Right. Exactly. It does an interesting thing in the tells that it has to kind of show you you're in a game world. I love that they highlight the absurdity of gaming tropes. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, these games are, they've gotten so immersive, which is something people have always said about video games. Sure. Pong was fucking immersive and involved decisions you make about your own reality. (laughs) But what actually happens is you walk up to a character and they go in a dialogue loop until you fucking choose the option the developers want. And then they give you, see, now we have trees of options that all lead you back to the same fucking place anyway. Sure. But to watch people be in a NPC loop Mm -hmm. in the movie (laughs) is fucking great. And that's where you start to question who's real, who's not. Uh, what is the nature of the reality in the game? Have one of our protagonists fallen into a loop? You know, mm-hmm. the first time her dialogue cycles. Sure. 
and you go, uh oh, what is what does this mean? And then they leave it alone. So you go, sure. well, I guess that wasn't a thing. And it turns out to kind of not be a thing. Right. Which is great. Cause the whole time you're going, I'm not gonna forget this scene. Sure. Something weird has happened. She's been replaced by one of them. Well, the thing the thing that this film does is that by the end of it, you don't even know where to start questioning what happened. Right. The final reveal of the film when all the characters are going, oh man, I I wish I could have stuck around longer. You guys were really good though. You guys did really good. Sure. I don't understand why I had to be knocked off so quick, but but it was fun. And then you get this this thing where you realize the things in the film that you thought carried weighted gravity, like existence being infected by that disease or sure. you know, just all that stuff that goes on in the quote reality portion. Right. Right. Of actual, oh, it's not even called existence by the end of it, is it? Right, it's, right. It's some other game. Some throwaway name that isn't the title of right, the film. but it's so capitalized it. at the right parts. And, right, right. By the end of the film, you can't figure out where to start questioning. And that is one of David Cronenberg's sure. biggest strengths is by the end of everything going, yeah, I know you're confused. I know you want to know all the answers, but this film doesn't contain them. Sure. This film contains a singular story arc that begins and ends where I started it and ended it. Right, right. And the ride is the experience also might still be a game. Yeah, it's not concerned with the the cheap, oh, is it a game or isn't it? Yes or no binary question. Sure. It doesn't want to boil the... And I think so many times uh, mindfuck kind of movies do that. Mm -hmm. where the entire thing gets thrown away in favor of one lingering sentence at the end, which goes, is it real or not? You decide. And it's supposed to elicit you to go out and talk to your friends about the fucking movie. But really, the top fell over. Sorry, what was I talking about? <laughs> um, you know, it uses those conventions to make you, say, question one of the protagonists. Uh, she sets the premise they're playing a game. Someone will win. So, you, mm -hmm. you know, you're sort of questioning her the whole time. but. It also, it's been a while since this happened with me, but I'm fearing a cop-out ending. Sure. And I was ready to, this is a huge credit to the film and just that I was ready to fucking sign off anyways. Yep. <laughs> In my head, I'm just going, how is this movie going to fucking cop out at the end? And how am I going to go, no, it's still a fucking masterpiece. Right. <laughs> and because I'm watching it so excited about, you know, old Cronenberg and the treatment of the title and the weird body horror stuff. I'm just going, this is a great movie. I'm totally going to own this. I don't care how much it fucks up its own ending, which I know it's going to do. <laughs> and it totally doesn't. I mean, I love that they bring everything together and they even make the most convoluted parts better by the fact that it's in a focus group inside a video game. Right. So, of course, people are going to explain things away and sometimes they're going to act like they get it, but sometimes they're going to need some serious fucking hand holding. The ending, you know, most convoluted part where mm -hmm. uh, there's only 10 minutes left in the movie and all of a sudden all these major plot twists all at once. These characters aren't who they seemed. What layer of the game are we on? It already seems to be setting us toward a path of, hey, fuck you, movie. What are you trying to do here? <laughs> and they all come out. And the first thing the guy says is, well, yeah, that ending was kind of kind of convoluted. I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah. To remind you of the or I guess inform you for the first time of the environment that you're playing in, the right. reality, uh, the top level of reality, which is the bigger concern. It's not just there to go, well, wait, I know some people won't like our ending. That's why I have a guy say it's convoluted. Right. It actually has a, a purpose to the narrative. And I love, too, that their minds crafted the game, which explains sure. so much of what happened. All of the leaps of faith and right. and near plot holes that the movie might have uh -huh. had, uh, none of that matters anymore when you consider the fact that parts of everybody's own reality or life was lended towards creating their characters, and that the rules of the the most inner part of the game, the most levels in, weren't really rules of the actual game. Right. Questions like, hey, she's a programmer. Why the fuck doesn't she know anything that's going on? Why isn't she giving him a better sense of where to go? I mean, those rules aren't solidified. They're a dream within a dream within a dream. Inside a Taco Bell, inside your mind. And then all the concern over the anti-game theme at the end, it's just clear enough to cause this sense of urgency that mm -hmm. I think makes the ending really work. Yeah. Because all of a sudden we go... 
no, no, no. Everything you saw was just, you know, it's all this nice encapsulated clean part. And then the real emergency is someone in this room of all these characters you've gotten to know will kill this man. Who's it going to be? Right. And without spending time, you know, stringing that out unnecessarily, they get right to it. And that ending is one of the things that makes me think, uh, maybe just because it pushes us so much away from what might have been convoluted otherwise, but even in the final layer of reality, I just like to think that that's pretty clearly reality. Mm -hmm. I don't really play the game of is it real or is it not. No. And I think that, you know, because I look at the, the points that Cronenberg is trying to make with this, and, you know, it could have gotten a super meta ending, but I think the message is pretty clear, that, that last sort of statement. I mean, these are two people who are upset that, you know, humanity has thrown themselves into this reality and they've given their mind over to other people. And the last line is, uh, to me anyways, it's less an ambiguous ending and more enforcing the point of the protagonists mm -hmm. that they come out of this game and one of the guys they're pointing their guns at doesn't even know if they're still in the game. You know, it's their cynical message about how we've blurred the line too much and now people can't even decide what's really reality. Sure. How do they make decisions? Right. You know, it feeds into the, the interest Cronenberg has in things like Videodrome, uh, his interest in how we interface with technology. Right. This is a lot less just looking at the, the interface and more the logical conclusion of where will technology go. Mm -hmm. It's him projecting into the future and going, if games are on a path to get more and more realistic, and that is happening at a, at a rate that at some point will brush up against reality or maybe even surpass it, you know, maybe things will feel more we'll have the ability to interact more with our nervous system, we'll feel more alive in games, right. more alive in games than reality. It's playing that out and considering those ideas. Something, something, long live the new flesh. You know, it's, <laughs> it's poking at those interests and then showing a subset of people who will, well, you know, don't worry everyone, it's not just a cynical message. Someone will be around to say, hey, long, long live reality and long live the, the human experience and the people who want to unplug right. as well. Sure. Whew, sorry, there's a lot of stuff at the end there. Well, man, that's doublefeatureshow.com, Death to the Tyrant, Eric Ingram, and Death to the Tyrant, uh, Michael Kester. If you have any information on why actors are great, that can be sent to doublefeatureshow at gmail.com, but there are other people who aren't actors mm -hmm. who are also considered great. Yeah, those would be the executive producers I think you're setting me up for. Yeah, knock it out of the park. Uh, Meta Somerville is great. Hannah Hughes is great. Maxwell Harley, Flint Ironstag, some of the greatest people to ever contribute to our show mm -hmm. and some of the only people to ever contribute to our show. Thanks really to everybody who funded the Kickstarter. But these guys did it just so we could mention their name on the fucking show, and good for them. Now their name's on the fucking show. Because of them, we're going to do two more movies next time. That's right. We're going to do Clown with a K and Safety Not Guaranteed. It's like an independent comedy, I don't know, death to double feature. Watch more fucking film. Long live the new flesh. Bye. On our show because I feel like I'll get in a Dan Aykroyd rant. So let me let me position this in a different way. Let me say there's an interesting uh, factoid. Uh huh. Ooh, you can't do that. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded like sounded like hip hop there. Oh, let's try that again. There's an interesting factoid about Dan Aykroyd. Oh man. So let's say there's an interesting fact about Dan Aykroyd. <laughs>